Why is Harry Potter so popular? Let's go back to the books then, the series of books. Why is it so popular? The first thing is because it's well written. It's a well written book. It's, I've read, I read the first one, I, I started through the second one. Uh, the second thing is it's a, it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's a lot of things in the book that are, that are fun, uh, it's very interesting. It actually makes school interesting. Oh, anyway. It's interactive. It's, it's saying some things in the school. They actually have a good time in the school. And, and you know what? In some schools, not this one, but there are some schools that the kids just do not have any fun. And they don't know how to enjoy learning. And so in the book, kids actually enjoy learning. And so I think it's very interesting. So the kids are looking at it. So that's going to be attractive to them. Number three, there's a fascination with the supernatural. I think it's very interesting that there are the adults in our country that are trying to do everything that we can to stamp out the supernatural. Anything that has to do with God or the supernatural, we're trying to get rid of. And yet, what's going on? You look at the, mov look at the movies, look at the TV shows, look at the books that are coming out, and so much of it has to do with the supernatural. We are fascinated by the supernatural. And yet, our higher learning would say, oh, but that's not true, and that's not really real. You know what? Let me, let me just let you in on something. The rest of the world has figured out that there is a supernatural. And we're, here we are, we haven't figured it out. There is a supernatural force that is at work in amongst us. Okay, uh, number four. The characters are children with whom the, re the uh, readers can relate. They're real relatable. They're real understandable. They're real people. They have struggles. They have problems. Kids can relate to those things. Number five, the main characters really have good characteristics. They're fairly good people. <coughs> now, what's right about Harry then? What's right about Harry Potter? The heroes are compassionate. They're courageous. They're self-sacrificing. And they want to do the right thing regardless of the risks. You know what else is right with Harry Potter? It gives us an opportunity to witness. It gives us an opportunity to witness because people are talking about the supernatural and you can therefore bring in the author of life and talk about the supernatural. It's like, well, let's talk about the supernatural. Let me tell you the one who really is supernatural. I mean, it gives you a great opportunity to try to witness to somebody about Christ. Okay, I, I'm not going to tell you to be a book burner because I don't think that that's what we're supposed to do. You engage in society. You don't become like it, but you engage in society. And all you got to do is look at the book of Acts and you'll realize that that's what Paul did. He took the books that were popular and he says, now let me show you. And he turns them around to use them so that he can witness for Christ. These can be great tools to witness for Jesus Christ. Number three, I think it's very interesting. At one point, Harry, in the first book, is protected, and he is protected by love. He is protected by the love of his mother. There was, a, there was somebody that was out there that was trying to cast a spell on Harry, and this is when Harry is just a baby. And the spell, because of the love of his mother, the mother wasn't there, but because of the love that the mother had for Harry, the spell hit that love and then bounced back upon the one who sent the spell. somewhat biblical there was one who loved us so much that he stood in the gap for us and the curse that was supposed to go to us fell upon him and then that curse went back right that's the gospel that's the gospel and right there I read that I thought oh, that's it but now let's talk about some of the things that there were struggles for me. The concerns I have are, number one, that it was well-written and it's a lot of fun. And if it wasn't well-written and it wasn't a lot of fun, nobody would be paying any attention to it and we wouldn't have to deal with it. So that kind of is a concern for me. Number two, it presents witchcraft as good and positive. Okay, uh, reading the book's not going to translate into occult practices, but I do believe that it is an opening so be, people become more fascinated with it. And it's something you have to be very, very careful of.
By disassociating magic and supernatural evil, it becomes possible to portray occult practices as good and healthy. The third concern that I've got is, Harry becomes a wizard for much the same reasons that children are attracted to witchcraft. Why do people get into witchcraft? They get into witchcraft because they're neglected, because they're abused, because they're the derelicts of society, because they're scum, or so they think. Harry, in the beginning of the book, had been tormented, abused. He ends up having to stay with a step family, which is an aunt and uncle who don't even care for him. He ends up sleeping most of the time in a cupboard. Uh, they, don't, they don't acknowledge his birthdays. And suddenly then somebody comes and says, you know what, you're supposed to be a wizard. That is the dream of every neglected and abused child. For somebody to walk in and say, you know what, you're important. And witchcraft does that for children. For the same reasons that Harry gets in to witchcraft are the same reasons that our children in society right now get into witchcraft. That is a grave concern for me in reading the book. Because we're not talking about well-adjusted children that can read the book and realize that, you know what, this is just a fantasy world and it's not true. We are also dealing with children that do not understand that it's a fantasy world and are looking at that and saying, if I could only be like that, if I could only have what he has, and they are beginning to get into witchcraft. That was my f the first thing that I looked at that I was extremely bothered by. Number four, the supernatural element. The series deals with the occult. <coughs> it says, I got this, uh, this is a quote from a lady who says this. She says, sure, you're seeing witches in Harry Potter do things they don't do in real life, but it is positive. They are friendly. They are good. The book might change the way people feel about us. Practicing Wiccan Witch, Phyllis Curon. It deals with the occult. You know what? Our society deals with the occult. The occult. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? What is it dealing with? It's dealing with the occult. Sabrina, uh, Charmed, and uh, of course the latest, I guess this latest show, I haven't seen this one, the one that's called Crossing Over, where you can actually connect with the dead, your dead relative through this guy. Can I tell you, you know what, you, you take it for what it's worth, it's my opinion. But you know what, if you're watching those shows, you are foolish. There is what, the scripture says, what has light to do with darkness? What has light to do with darkness? The movies, those shows are dark. Those shows are oppressive. Those shows are occultic. Why would you immerse yourself in that? Just my opinion, you can do with it what you want. But why would you spend hours in front of that? Well, let me ask you this. If you're spending hours in front of that, are you still spending hours with this? And what are you spending more time with? It will have an effect. Occult situations always have an effect. Okay, the supernatural element. What happens is, is that Harry Potter, they're, they're assuming a supernatural realm. Here's the other thing. This is another thing that really bothers me about the book. <coughs> the supernatural element here. Uh, there is this world within a world. Okay, the people that aren't, that aren't uh, witches and wizards are called muggles, M-U-G-G-L-E-S. They're called muggles. Okay, and these are the unenlightened people that don't have any idea that there is a world that's out there that is the supernatural. And only the enlightened people know about the supernatural stuff, and of course the only enlightened people are witches and wizards and those that are with them. What bothers me is, this is, now we're looking at the big picture. Okay, I want you to look at the bigger picture. 
if you if you pull this together with like Buffy and you pull it together with like Sabrina and, and different things like this, what I believe is going on is Satan is rewriting the book on the supernatural. And he's elevating himself as the only one that really has supernatural powers. And the only one that has supernatural powers or anything that's supernatural is going to have to do with witches and witchcraft and occultic activities. See what I'm saying? And, and, and then it's pulling down anything that has to do with Christianity, has anything to do with religion that's good, and they're saying, you know what, there's no supernatural element in that. And what's sad is, is that some, I really believe this, that some of the church, the body of Christ is believing this, that there's really no supernatural element with God. How can you not think that there's anything supernatural when it has to do with God? You see what I'm saying? What's going on is it's, it's this switch, this gradual switch where, where, where Satan is becoming more important and he's the one that's writing the book on the supernatural and God is just taking this, not only a back seat, he's being pretty much rewritten. He's being written out. You know, and you see that in our history books. You know, our history, they've, they've written out anything that has to do with religion. They've written, written out anything that has to do with Christianity. You have to go back and look and to realize that much of our country is based not on Christianity, but much of our history is based upon Christianity and is based upon revivals that have happened in our land. The Second Great Awakening preceded the Civil War. The Second Great Awakening happened across the United States because of the Second Great Awakening, which was, a, which was all these preachers going out and preaching all through the land, people being, becoming converted. There, is, there was a fervor to get rid of slavery. And the history, the history books will not write this, but I do believe that the reason for the part of the reason for the war between the states, the, the reason for the, the North side, part of the North trying to get rid of slavery has to do with Christianity because people began to get saved people began to realize the dignity that every person had and it began to change the face of our country but you'll never read that in a history book what is going on is, is that, that gradually anything with Christianity and religion is being written out or being passed off as it doesn't count now, that doesn't have to do necessarily with Harry Potter. I'm just trying to get you to see the big picture. There's something beyond just these series of books. You know what? These series of books will come, and then they're going to go. And that's going to be the end of it. But the influence that they have will last beyond that. And that's what my concern is. It's with these books and with other books that go along with that. Okay, so the supernatural element is there. There is a supernatural world, by the way. Uh, Harry talked about it last week, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. is talking about the, the hierarchy in the supernatural realm. Let me give you some other scriptures that go with that. Ephesians 1.21. You can look these up later on. Romans 8.38. Luke 10.18. Jesus stood there and he said, you know what? I saw Satan fall from heaven. There is a supernatural world. There is something that's going on in the supernatural. Acts 13, 7 through 10, and 16, 16 through 18 deals with, with casting out demons. It has to do with the occult and getting rid of the occult and getting rid of the occult because of Jesus Christ. There is one who is greater than the occult activities. <coughs> C.S. Lewis, anybody read the Screw Tape Letters? Have any, any of you ever read that? I would encourage all of you to read this book. It's called The Screw Tape Letters. It was written by a man named C.S. Lewis. He was writing as if it were two demons that were talking to try to bring down a Christian. And you read through this book, and you're going to see some things in there, and you're going to see the things that you fell for. Because I read the book, and I saw things that I fell for. Eye opening. But what it's talking about is two different demons that are at work trying to bring a Christian down. One of the things that C.S. Lewis says is this. 
He said there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall into about the devil. One is to disbelieve in their existence, which a lot of people do. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased with both errors and hail a materialistic or a magician with the same delight. <coughs> Do you know that most Christians, the majority of Christians, believe that there's not a devil? There is one. And Scripture clearly teaches that. That there is a real devil and he is out to destroy the lives of other people. He has angels that are with him that are trying to do the same thing. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. Ephesians chapter 6. That is exactly what's going on. And there is a devil at work in this world. And he is out to destroy you. Let's look at number 5. The supernatural element without God is the authority. I want to compare. I've read... Before I read the book, before I read Harry Potter, the first one, uh, I have read, and I've read several opinions from different Christians. Some that are think there's no problem with it, all the way to the other extreme, which is, you absolutely shouldn't have it in your house, you better burn them immediately. I've read those, I've read everything in between. To try to figure out and try to discern, Lord, what is it that you're really trying to say? When these books are talked about, they're compared with two other series of books. One is the Chronicles of Narnia, which is written by C.S. Lewis, and the second is the Lord of the Rings, which is written by Tolkien. Tolkien was a Christian and actually helped to bring C.S. Lewis to Christ. I've read both of the other series, Chronicles of Narnia and The Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is much more difficult for children 11 and 12 to read, but if you have not read to your children or have not gotten them to read The Chronicles of Narnia, you need to. Because it is clearly a better series and it is clearly a series that focuses on Christ. It's great great allegory about Christ and about what God does in the lives of people. I love the last book. It's called The Last Battle. It's one of my favorite books. And I've read that over several times. And every time, I just brings chills to me. It's an incredible book about the last days. And anyway, the book, the, the, the Harry Potter series has been, has been compared to those two books. I mean, those two series of books. And when I first heard about him, I thought, okay, Harry Potter is probably along the same lines of those two books, and other people have said so. I've read the first book, and I'm going to tell you that it is not on the same lines as these two books. I do not believe it for a minute. And I would not in any way put them on the same level. These two books, both C.S. Lewis and the Tolkien books, both are worlds that are set apart from our world. There's nothing wrong with fantasy books. I'm not going to tell you that there's anything wrong with it because I don't believe that there are. What I'm trying to get you to see is that there's, there's differences that we need to look at. Both of these books have to do with a world that is apart from ours and there's clearly good versus evil. And the good forces are at work and they use a certain set of rules that would be upstanding the Potter book does not always necessarily do that. There is a good versus evil, but there are times when good versus evil, good works because the end justifies the means. The Tolkien book and the Lewis books do not do that. And here's the other part that I, I struggle with is the fact that in the Potter books, there is a world within our world that is at work which is true. But again, the only people that are enlightened are those that are dealing in witchcraft and those that are dealing with the occult. And therein lies the difference. And that is where I struggle with them. Is because the, uh, the idea is the only way to be enlightened 
is to be in the midst of witchcraft. She doesn't say that, but I, the implication in the book is very strong. Whereas the other two books, it is another world that is apart from our world. But again, it's dealing with good, good versus evil, and it's good dealing with higher authorities. Both of these books deal with higher authorities, the Lewis and the Tolkien books. Okay. The morality, number six, is there's a morality without God. <coughs> Rowling says this, she said, My wizarding world is a world of the imagination. I think it's a moral world. What scares me, though, is that by her own admission, she has said that gradually, as you go through the series of books, by the time you get to the end, they will become more and more dark. Dark, to me, translates into evil. I don't know how else to translate it. They will become more evil, and they will become so to the point of there's a blurring of the lines between good and evil. And that bothers me. Again, it bothers me because we're dealing with children. We're not dealing with adults that can read this and can look at this and say, okay, I know that there's a problem here. We're dealing with kids that at this point do not have the discerning, discerning ability to be able to tell the difference. So what, is this, what does this give to us? It gives us opportunities for Christians. Ephesians 5.11 says this, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. What does this do for us as Christians? Number one, I don't believe you can just condemn the books without any argument. I'm not telling you to condemn the books. What I'm telling you to do is you need to have an argument as to why you have problems with the books, if you do. And personally, I do. Why? You know, Christians, we have a problem here in the sense of we just wholesalely condemn things and just throw them out, and then the world condemn, just wholesalely throws us out because we've got no decent argument. We just say, well, it's bad and they're bad, and there's, we should just get rid of them. As Christians, we must have a logical understanding for why we believe what we believe and what we want to say in rebuttal to the words that are spoken. Okay? Number two, I think it gives us opportunities because then we can discuss where the moral virtues of Harry come from. The moral virtues from Harry come from a moral God. They come from somebody, somebody that's a higher authority. In the books, it's morality just for the sake of morality. And let me tell you something. If you have morality based just upon what everybody else thinks, eventually morality will slip and become more and more immoral. What it becomes is a society that morality is based on, and, and hear me now, because the postmodernist idea is this, morality is based on what the majority thinks. Morality is based on what the majority thinks, and morality is based on whatever I think. What's moral for me is not necessarily moral for you. And you know what you have? You have this mishmash of nobody can figure out what's right and what's wrong. Once you remove God from the situation, you're going to end up with chaos. Because God becomes the center of authority. And when you remove that authority, then you have everybody doing what was right in their own eyes. And you know what? If you have everybody doing what was right in your own eyes, it will become gradually more and more immoral. And if you don't believe me, go back and look at your history. You can see society after society because that is what has happened. Morality is based on the majority and morality without God sinks into fascism, and Nazism, Communism, Totalitarianism. Okay. Number three, the opportunities for Christians. It gives us an opportunity to talk about the supernatural realm and the one who has the supernatural realm, which is the Lord. And number four, please immerse yourselves in the Scripture first. 
you got to be focused on Scripture before you look at anything else. And if you're not immersed in Scripture, you're not prepared when you come up against some of these things that I think are evil. Then again, your decision is based on what the morality of the society is rather than the morality of what God has set up. Let me give you the bottom line. Just my opinion again. You can do with it whatever you want. I don't think you ought to go to the movie. Okay, and the re- let me give you the reasons for it. I am not going to elevate something that I see is wrong. And you elevate something by putting your money into it. Hollywood sees that. We're going to put our money into it. Number one, we look, we look stupid as Christians because we say one thing and do another. But you know what? I, I can just, I haven't, I've seen the trailers and I know enough to realize what Hollywood will do and they will elevate the witchcraft part of it. They just do. Because you know what? That's what sells. Supernatural stuff is what sells. And so they're going to do that. I got to tell you, I think that some of the special effects will look really cool. But I'm not going to go see it because I don't want to elevate something that I think is wrong. I wouldn't go to the movie. And I don't think you ought to take your kids to the movie. Hey, but then again, that's my opinion. You can do with it what you want. I don't think that you want your kids picturing that. Number two, I think it glorifies witchcraft. And I think you have to be very wary of that. Anytime that there's a glorification of something that is evil, you have to be aware of it. Again, I'm not going to tell you to burn the books. I didn't, I'm telling you, you need to be very aware of the things that are going on here. There are some good things about the book, but there are some things that are very evil about the book. The world view, number three, the worldview of, of uh, the book differs greatly from the worldview of Christianity. Again, the worldview according to that book is that uh, the only enlightened people are witches. The only people that really know what's going on are those that are, that are into witchcraft and wizards. Other than Christianity. Uh, the last thing is that I, I believe that it leads people. It doesn't always, but it can lead people into a fascination with other things that are all cult in nature. It leads you to a greater fascination with things that are evil. And it becomes an alternative. Do, do with what I've given you this morning, whatever you would like, but you know what? Whatever you're going to do, please base it on scripture please base it on what is right and wrong according to scripture and according to what the Lord would tell you you know what if you say well I still want to go see the movie you know do this for me you pray and say Lord what would you have me do and then don't do like my children do run off and wait not wait for the answer you listen you listen for the answer and then you'll be obedient if you do have the books you know if your children have read them you better sit down and read them you better sit down and read them you better go through them with your kids you better talk to them about the areas where there are problems because you know what kids will walk out of reading those books and say witchcraft is okay And don't assume that because your child goes to church and goes to a Christian school that they're going to know better. Because they will not necessarily know better. You are the one, as parents and grandparents, you are the ones that set the tone for what they're going to believe and not believe. And you need to very clearly sit down and say, my son, my daughter, here are some things that I'm struggling with. Here are some things that I believe that are not right. And lay it out for them. They're going to roll their eyes and say, oh, Dad, oh, Mom, you're going to do whatever it is that they're going to do, but you know what? They will listen. And they need to know what you believe. Because if they don't know what you believe, 
they're going to come up with their own belief system. And the world is more than willing to give your child a belief system that is contrary to what Scripture teaches. Sit down and talk to your kids. Lay it out for them. If they've read it, or if they choose to read it, or if you choose to read it, you know, that, that's up to you. But you had better talk to them about it. And you'd better lay out what's evil and what's not. I wouldn't take my kids to the movie. If my kids were old enough, I wouldn't do it. And you know what? Some of you are going to say, but they'll be the only kid in school that, that won't go. Hmm. I think that's scriptural. Because Jesus talked about that. That you're going to be, there's times when you're going to stand alone. I'd rather stand alone for what's right. Be discerning. Be involved in what your kids are doing. Find out what they're reading. Find out what they're watching. And you uh, lay ground rules. There is not anything wrong with that. And stay in the Word. Let's pray. Jesus, we sure do need you. You know, again, we just ask for your help because, you know what, God, it's, it's hard. It's hard to figure out right and wrong. You know, there's some things, Lord, that are so clear. And there's some things, Lord, that there's enough truth in it, we think, well, what about it? Lord, help us to realize when Satan does come in as an angel of light. Help us that our eyes would be open to the truth because the truth would set us free. Help us to know, Lord, what the enemy is doing. To be aware of it and to stand against him. Lord, we stand in the gap right now for our children. We stand in the gap for them, God, and we pray for your mercy and your blessing upon them. We plead your blood over each one of them, Father. And we ask God for wisdom in raising them because we desperately need you. The world is pulling them every which way. But Lord, your word says, take care, I have overcome the world. So Lord, help us that we too, as we walk in you, would overcome the world and the forces that come against us. Your grace is always sufficient, God. Thank you for that.